Welcome everybody to what is now the 10th lecture in our summer lecture series titled From the Rooftops. These lectures are coming to you from the Landscape Architecture Faculty here in the Landscape Architecture Department at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. My name is Richard Weller, I'm the Chair of the Department, and today it's my great pleasure to introduce you to David Gouverneur. Professor Gouverneur is the Professor of Practice in the Department of Landscape Architecture. He's also been awarded the G. Holmes Perkins Award for Distinguished Teaching, not once, but twice. David received his Master's in Architecture in Urban Design from Harvard University in 1980, and he has a Bachelor of Architecture from the Universidad Simón Bolívar in Caracas, Venezuela from 1977. He was Chair of the School of Architecture at the Simón Bolívar Universidad in, from 1987 to 91, as well as a Professor in this school's Departments of Architecture and City and Regional Planning from 1980 to 2008. From 1991 to 1996, he was the Director and Adjunct Secretary of Urban Development of Venezuela. He was co-founder and professor of the Urban Design Program and director of the Mayor's Institute of Urban Design at the Universidad Metropolitana, both created with the support of Harvard University in Caracas, Venezuela. His area of research focuses on the notion of what he calls informal armatures. This is an alternative method to address the rampant urbanization in developing countries where a high percentage of the population already lives and will live in self-constructed urban areas. The ideas are condensed in his most recent book titled Planning and Design for New Informal Settlements, Shaping the Self-Constructed City, published by Routledge. Professor Gouverneur frequently offers cross-disciplinary design studio courses addressing social, environmental, cultural and economic issues in developing countries, mainly in Latin America and Africa. The products of these studios are frequently shared with host cities to induce further discussion and changes in local policies. These studios are legendary here in the Weizmann School of Design and his students receive many awards for their work. So with that, I would like you to join me in welcoming David Gouverneur to the digital lectern for today's lecture. Enjoy the lecture. COVID-19 has revealed how vulnerable our cities and societies are. And the social unrest that we've seen in the United States during the past weeks have signaled the value of cultural diversity, the importance of social inclusion, and the consideration of emotions and feelings. Hi, my name is David Gouverneur. I am Professor of Practice in the Department of Landscape Architecture and also in the Department of City and Regional Planning uh, here at the Weizmann School of Design. Today, I would like to share with you a program that I have called Seeding Change in the Latin American Landscape. I hope you will enjoy it. As I usually do in my classes, I combine um, ideas that I believe have a certain pedagogical value with stories, with uh, anecdotes, and that's what life is all about. First, I would like to tell you a bit about my background. My parents were native New Yorkers who made Venezuela home in the early 1950s. My mother was a Russian Jew and my father was African Latino. For decades, Venezuela was one of the richest countries in the world thanks to the exploitation of its large oil reserves. It was a solid democracy, free of racial and religious conflict, multicultural, and it attracted millions of immigrants from post-war Europe, the Middle East, and also from all over Latin America. This is a mosaic of uh, some of the great places in which I grew up. The upper left, the covered plaza at Central University, uh, with artwork of great masters as Fernand Léger or Henri Laurent, uh, following these amazing acoustic clouds of uh, our uh, beloved Philadelphian Alexander Calder. Next, the water plaza of the Parque del Este of the famous Brazilian landscape architect uh, Roberto Burle Marx. The park is located just uh, 10 minutes away from where I live. Um, 
lower left, the tower on the mountain, which divides the city from the Caribbean, was designed by Tomas Sanabria. And uh, this project was on the poster of the exhibit on Latin American architecture held in MoMA a few years ago. Mm, the lower right is also a Burle Marx project, uh, the Botanical Garden of Maracaibo. And the restoration of this project was carried out by my dear colleagues and former students, Maria Villalobos and Carla Urbina. It was the first time that a landscape architecture project won the Architecture Biennale in Venezuela. And finally, in the lower center, there's one of the patios of the, uh, my old house in Caracas that I have been restoring for the last 18 years. After studying architecture uh, at Universidad Simón Bolívar, uh, that you see depicted in the image, uh, I attended the GSD uh, to study urban design in the late 70s on a Venezuelan scholarship. Following commencement, I began teaching at my Latin alma mater. And by uh, the age 31, I was chair of the architecture program. Simultaneously, I engaged in professional practice in architecture, city planning, urban design, and historic preservation. In the early 1990s, I became national director of urban development in the country. And here, uh, within a huge group, I had 23,000 employees scattered around the country. We enacted hundreds of territorial, urban, and district plans assisting regional municipal governments with a diversity of local actors. My office was in the top floor of that tower. And um, we promptly realized that for half of the population in Venezuela living in informal settlements, the traditional planning uh, instruments had no meaning, had no impact. With a group of professionals and researchers that had dedicated many decades studying informality, we produced a plan for the rehabilitation of the informal settlements of the capital city, where 1.4 million people uh, lived. Uh, we worked at a metropolitan scale and also at an urban design scale. We organized national competitions, and uh, this uh, resulted in a frenzy and an interest for attending the informal settlements. These initial moves were aimed at relocating the population that was settled on high-risk sites in substitution housing within the same neighborhoods. Land stabilization, afforestation, and something very important is providing the community with uses that were relevant to them, occupying the land from which we had removed the homes that were on an unstable situation, and then improvements of infrastructure, public spaces, and community services. In the mid-1990s, I co-founded with Oscar Grauer the first urban design program in Latin America with the support of the GSD. Here, we also created the Venezuelan version of the Mayor's Institute in Urban Design and the Urban Design Center, which further connected academia with the needs of the country. Thanks to the relation with the GSD, we had a plethora of visiting professors and lecturers that became close friends of the program. At the end of the millennia, we were asked by the government to develop the plan for the rehabilitation of the Litoral Central, the coastline adjacent to the capital city, where more than 25,000 people had died due to torrential flooding. This was one of the first green infrastructure and multi-scalar projects in Latin America. The plan was a combination of large-scale territorial planning, urban design. Um, we work with interdisciplinary groups, architects, landscape architects, hydrologists, geologists. We also had the uh, opportunity to work with professors uh, from other countries. Peter Rowe, who was the dean at Harvard, Ken Greenberg from Toronto, uh, John, Bus John Busquets from Barcelona, Antoine uh, Grumbach uh, from France, and so on. and also very site-specific interventions. For instance, green infrastructure up in the National Park uh, meant to capture debris and reduce uh, the energy of the flow, which then enabled um, green uh, soft infrastructure canals downstream, 
provided uh, the space for relocation housing. We also used the debris, the rocks, um, to reshape the coastline with jetties and le uh, levees. And this was a very important move to revitalize the economy of the area. Now, in 1999, Hugo Chavez was elected president, preaching on an anti-corruption, social inclusion, and strong man leadership platform with a very aggressive and non-conventional rhetoric. He was a military, by the way. In 2000, a new constitution was adopted, which centralized power in the executive branch, giving it control of the military promotions, reducing the autonomy of governors, of mayors, of the judiciary, and also of the press. Chavez announced that he aspired Venezuela would follow the happy path of Cuba. Having lost their financial support with the disintegration of the Soviet Union, Cuba began providing military assistance and intelligentsia to Venezuela in exchange for free oil, and eventually took over the country. 20 years of corruption and mismanagement led to the worst economic downfall of any country during the last century, with widespread poverty, malnutrition, repression, violence, and also resulted in the biggest outgoing migration of any nation not at war. As oil prices dropped and the local petroleum industry was dismantled, the government embarked in the drug trade and mining, in the deforestation of tropical forests, even within national parks. The regime, now openly a dictatorship, is supported by Cuba, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and China, countries interested in the oil and other mineral resources and their geopolitical presence in the region, but with no interest in the Venezuelan people. This is how, in 2002, I began teaching part-time in the Department of Landscape Architecture. First, elective studios, uh, then core curriculum studios in the realm of landscape or ecological urbanism. For these reasons, it was clear to me that it was futile to continue teaching and practicing in a militarized and foreign controlled Venezuela, in which a small group, power thirsty, uh, had taken uh, total control and was destroying the country. I had to leave. Since then, I have taught cross discipline studios, theory, case studies, and brief design exercise courses focusing mainly on cities of the Global South. This is just a reminder that nothing can be taken for granted. Attacks on basic human rights, democracy, and civilization happen and must be counteracted with vigor and at the earliest phase as possible. I felt it was relevant to share with you this information to better appreciate how the following ideas and proposals addressing compelling issues faced by Latin America stem from merging academic, professional practice, and general knowledge of the region with cutting-edge approaches in planning and design, advance with my colleagues and students here at the Weizmann School of Design. So, here we go. So, which are then the topics that require urgent attention? The presentation is organized in two parts. First, I would like to mention some common features that we can find through Latin America, despite being the region one of the most diverse areas in, in the planet. And from there, I would like to identify some topics that require urgent attention, illustrating the responses through case studies. Latin America is still the region with the greatest social inequalities, and there is escalating social tension. It is highly urbanized, and the population is augmenting rapidly. It is considered the most biodiverse region in the world, but its habitats are threatened by urbanization and agricultural practices, mining, and infrastructural projects carried out without environmental considerations. 
a high percentage of the population lives and will live in informal settlements, frequently in disadvantage in relation to the formal city and occupying high-risk sites. But we've also been able to develop projects, cutting-edge mm, initiatives aimed at improving self-constructed settlements which have become world references as in the case of Medellin. Geologically, it is a very young region. Forces of nature affect its infrastructure, communities, economies, and environmental systems. By the way, this church that you see here on the image on the right is in the colonial town of La Guaira, founded in 1589. My Venezuelan grandparents got married in this church. This uh, village was uh, leveled by torrential flooding and it's uh, proof that climate change is a fact and that a uh, destructive event of this uh, nature and magnitude had not occurred in over 500 years. It is also a region with a rich cultural heritage. It, uh, it is a sponge um, that absorbs influences uh, and it's prone to adopt foreign models without considering their impact. We also suffer from uh, political, institutional, academic, and professional fragmentation. We work in silos. And the region also has very high indicators of corruption, violence, managerial weakness, and uh, broken legal systems. And something that is very Latino is, if I am okay, who cares about the rest? And this translates into a disdain for the common good. Um, on the photograph on the left, you see this beautiful concrete structure built in the late 1950s, a covered walkway at Central University, a World Heritage Site. The picture was taken only three weeks ago. It collapsed under heavy rains due to the lack of maintenance. And let's keep in mind that periods of extraordinary events, of stress, of conflict, or the impact of forces of nature, or the pandemic, offer the opportunity of introducing new approaches and seeding change. The pandemic certainly revealed the social and environmental challenges that uh, Latin America faces, but it also demonstrated its malleability and resourcefulness. Planning and design intelligence may provide the frameworks to sustain the ecological and social processes responding to these challenges. And academia within this context has a pivotal role to play. The case studies I would like to share with you derive from uh, professional practice, teaching, and research, particularly what I have called the informal armatures approach. The approach calls to act in a preemptive manner. It envisions multi-scalar moves. It is landscape driven. It tackles the physical, the morphological, but as well as the performative, uh, the processes. It focuses on the public realm. It is very selective of the moves that are relevant in each context. It considers the transformative conditions. And something which is very important within this context it secures the spatial requirements to cope with the changing demands. The approach uh, suggests a system of simple design and performative components, as well as managerial techniques to address these topics, which can be adopted to different conditions. The design components have been classified into three categories corridors, patches, and stewards. The corridors, these elongated elements that seem to adapt to the landscape, conduct the flow of people, goods, water. They're the support uh, elements of the organism. The patches that look like organs, some have dots and some do not. The dots represent the land that is made available to facilitate the process of informal urbanization. The black disc represent the uses that any city aspires to have. 
hospitals, parks, uh, technical schools, manufacturing areas, and that never occurs spontaneously within the informal city. And finally, the stewards are these dots that have an influence over a broader territory. They can operate over the patches and over the corridors, and they help to monitor, to guide the transformations, and also play a very important role in securing the spatial uh, requirements to cope with changing demands. Some corridors protect the environmental systems, uh, providing community uses that keep them free from informal or formal urbanization. Other corridors attract occupation towards favorable uh, locations. Uh, they concentrate the mobility systems, the services, the main public spaces, the commercial activities. The productive patches have the ability to transform over time. So, for instance, let's say that in an early phase of occupation, one of these red patches, the one in the lower left, is a recycling center that provides materials for the self-constructed process. Over time, as the first neighborhood consolidates, this uh, recycling uh, patch is transferred to a new frontier and the land is available for other communal uses. The receptor patches allow the communities to self-construct their neighborhoods and this can be done in the manner in which they've always done it but also it could be carried out with technical assistance predefining grids, the location of public spaces, infrastructure, lot sizes, the initial uh, housing shell and so on. The stewards are institutions, NGOs, organizations that are highly respected by the community, uh, such as the case of the public library system in Medellin, in Colombia, that keeps uh, uh, an eye and maintenance over their, uh, the open space adjacent to the library. These components are expected to interact and to create a network that sustains a robust urban ecology. Well, this uh, is the theory. Let's see how these elements can play out through case studies. I have organized the case studies in four different uh, topics. A, reducing disparities between the formal and the informal city, connecting them, and assisting emerging self-constructed settlements. B, addressing climate change, the reduction of risks, and the rehabilitation after destructive events. C, fostering urban agriculture, water management, and local economies. And D, multi-scalar and hybrid responses, which in a way are a combination of the previous topics uh, in very large and complex territories. All the projects are the result of interdisciplinary studios here at Meyerson developed by students of landscape architecture, architecture, city planning, and historic preservation. Let us begin with a very simple case study. In the city of Medellin in Colombia, the students identified former um, quarry sites, defunct quarry sites that have no real estate value, but are ideal locations to develop self-constructed communities by providing green armatures, protecting the streams and environmental assets. And the lines that you see here is a zigzagging network of pedestrian vehicular paths. Also, the former um, service uh, buildings of the quarry become the locations for the new community centers. In another site in Medellin, informal settlements are randomly occupying agricultural land. The proposal identifies areas suitable for occupation, creates a new centrality with community services and markets, protects the environmental systems as well as the agricultural land. This is a larger site also in Medellin, uh, in a municipality that is expected to be the new growth area of the city. Um, it is located by the Medellin River. The proposal establishes a green armature protecting the floodplain of the river, establishing transversal fingers from the lowlands to the upper elevations. The highest part of the mountain is very unstable land. 
In the section, we can see at the left, the park taking advantage of the floodplain of the Medellin River. Then, a mid-density, mixed-use, formal development, and the slope of the mountain is terraced, creating the platforms that are adequate for the self-constructed neighborhood. Finally, on the upper right, we see a park library that serves as a steward, keeping the development from encroaching on the higher unstable land. It is important to mention that all of these projects are carried out in collaboration with local partners. Such was the case of the Quito, Ecuador project, which was made in collaboration with the municipality of Quito. Daniel Sainz, at the time director of public spaces, was a graduate of the landscape architecture program at Penn. And Mayor Mauricio Rodas is a, had his master's in political science also from Penn. Mayor Rodas is now a scholar at World Perry House. These projects were presented jointly by Penn and the municipality of Quito in the very important Habitat III conference. In these images, we can see some student projects aim at connecting the informal settlements that are located in very steep terrain close to the historic uh, district of Quito, but disconnected functionally, spatially, culturally, and economically. The following images correspond to an area called Quitumbe, located in the south of Quito. Here, the intent of the project was to connect, to link, a very large public housing project seen here at the left with very uh, recent new informal settlements at very early phases of occupation. The connections, the links are managed through bike lanes, pedestrian paths, bridging over the ravines and locating park libraries, markets and other communal uh, facilities in strategic positions. These communal services act as stewards, not only for recreational spaces as those here represented by the floodplain of the ravine, but also uh, are intended to foster agricultural production. Let's go over some case studies corresponding to category B, addressing climate change risks and the rehabilitation after destructive events. These are images of the small town of Chamangas located on the Pacific coast of Ecuador. Chamangas was leveled a few years ago after a very powerful quake. Now, the main reason of the devastation was not the quake. The cause of the problem can be traced to these small graphics on the lower left-hand side. In dark green, we can see the mangroves that covered the area only 25 years ago, and to the right, the remaining fragments of mangroves. These were gradually removed to accommodate for shrimp farming by transnational companies uh, with permits granted by the government. As the mangroves were removed, erosion began and the sediments advanced the coastline. The communities that had built on solid land for centuries had to build on stilts on the unstable coastal land and thus were vulnerable to the quake. In order to provide for the safe reconstruction of the homes by the community, the students proposed platforms suspended on deep pillars anchored in the bedrock, which would make them stable. The students did research on mangrove restoration techniques and were assisted uh, by Professor Mario Shetman, a distinguished Mexican landscape architect with experience in the topic. They proposed an experimental a uh, mangrove restoration project associated with an ecological shrimp and mollusk farming uh, installation adjacent to the school. The idea was to uh, teach uh, youngsters these very simple techniques that eventually could be from the town expanded to a larger territorial area, improving the ecology and setting grounds for a sustainable economy in the near future. This is a very interesting case study situated in the port city of Valparaíso in Chile. Valparaíso is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Some 60 years ago, the Chilean government encouraged the plantation of eucalyptus in order to develop the wood industry. And nothing is more harmful in terms of desiccating the land 
than eucalyptus. Thus, the area mm, frequently suffers from forest fires. A few years ago, the flames hit the higher elevation of the city in which the informal settlements are located. And being Chile, a subtropical country, most of these settlements are constructed in wood. In one evening, close to 25,000 people lost their homes. The project proposes a buffer, a barrier, between the eucalyptus and the communities, in which eucalyptus are replaced by less combustible local species. A service road is incorporated to allow the access of firefighters, and dams are constructed to capture the water during the rainy season to be used during the dry season. Recreational areas on flatter land also may serve as evacuation sites during a similar event. Let's go over some case studies corresponding to Category C, Fostering Urban Agriculture, Water Management, and Local Economies. This is the case study of Circasia, a county located in the coffee growing area of Colombia. It is the largest UNESCO World Heritage Cultural Landscape site. More than 30 years ago, they substituted shade uh, coffee by sunlit coffee, removing the tropical forest. This had very serious consequences on the environment, affecting biodiversity, increasing erosion. Also, sunlit coffee after 10 years of production requires great amounts of fertilizers, which are polluting the streams. The UNESCO declaration did not um, acknowledge this environmental crisis. The studio began by researching on the different techniques to gradually reintroduce shade coffee through afforestation and succession. The students also realized that the population is moving from the rural areas to the small towns leaving behind the agricultural techniques. Also, that the urban fabric is predominantly informal. Therefore, a strong tool to be able to enhance sustainable agricultural production is reintroducing shade coffee in the vicinity of the towns or within the communities. The idea, again, is that the communities, as they grow, as they self-construct, do so in an intimate relation with the reforestation and the agricultural production. A feature common throughout Latin America is that the urban fabric turns its back to the creeks. These are not only frequently polluted, but also out of sight. This project intends to reconfigure the relation between the community and the creeks. It proposes a cultural plaza that engages with the main street of the town. The creek is reforested with mm, guadua, which is a local bamboo, not only adequate for mm, purifying the waters, but also providing low-cost construction material that is ideal to resist quakes. This town was leveled by a major seismic event only 10 years ago. The urban plan for Circasia resulted in a combination of moves such as the stabilization of slopes and uh, replanting with local species to protection of the environment and systems and weaving the fragmented urban tissue with links, some vehicular, some pedestrian over the creeks and providing land for self-constructed communities. The reforestation practices that begin within the town of Circasia could be extended throughout the county and to the other 147 municipalities of the Zona Cafetera. Let's now embark on the last category, dealing with multi-scalar and hybrid responses on very large-scale territorial systems. We begin with the case study of the Colombian Caribbean coastline. In this montage, we can see the privatization of the waterfront 
with a high rise formal uh, real estate operations, pushing the residential and predominantly informal areas towards the rear. These informal areas not only are eroding the environmental systems, but are polluting the streams, which eventually pollute the waterfront, in theory, the economic driver of the real estate. The students began by projecting what urban growth could look like over the next 35 years, resulting in a continuous urban ban blocking the environmental systems, the relation between the hinterland, the mountains, and the coast. Then they identified and mapped the environmental systems, establishing green corridors that connect the mountain habitat with the coastline. A public transportation system represented in the white line allows to densify and foster occupation into adequate location where formal and informal development is combined. Please take note at the most southern tip where we can see a small uh, lagoon or marshland. This is the city of Cartagena. We will zoom into it. Cartagena is a major tourist destination. But most visitors attracted by the beautiful historic district, by the beaches, the hotels, and the condos, do not know that 80% of the city is comprised of informal settlements. Many of these have been constructed by landfilling the marsh and eliminating the mangroves, which has had serious consequences on the ecology of this body of water. The image in the upper center in blue indicates the areas that are projected to be underwater <laughs> due to the effect of climate change and sea level rise, including the international airport. To complicate matters, the population is expected to double over the next 30 years. That means that at least 800,000 people will self-construct their habitats following the same patterns, that is, occupying part of the marsh and eliminating the remaining um, mangroves. So what can be done? The students began by reimagining the relation between the body of water, the existing city of Cartagena, and future urbanization. They suggested two strategies. One was carving a series of canals that would differentiate the humid areas from the dry areas. The intrusion of water would facilitate the migration of the mangroves and the ecological restoration of La Cienega. They also identified the areas that would be suitable for urbanization, particularly for the self-constructed communities. This project proposes a botanical armature to foster a self-constructed district, taking advantage of the alignment of trees that currently define property lines. The armature provides for accessibility, the location of public spaces, land for agricultural and wood production, and protects the system of creeks. It is embedded between an existing informal settlement and a large public housing project. The following project, located just north of the previous one, identifies and seeks to protect a rich habitat comprised of mangroves and dry forests. This habitat should be protected in order to create the large metropolitan park for the future of Cartagena. The park may include stadiums, universities, hospitals, and other large metropolitan facilities, setting the stage for mixed-use real estate operations, favoring the mix of income in this area of future urbanization. The following project envisions how to take advantage of the large tract of public land once relocated the airport due to the effect of climate change. A cut-fill operation allows, on the one hand, 
to create a mangrove park enhancing the ecology of the marsh and flood-free land for both informal self-constructed communities and high-scale real estate operations. The following is a particularly interesting and meaningful case study. It deals with the metropolitan area of Bogota, the Colombian capital. It tackles issues facing many developing countries, which are how to secure the protection of biodiversity, agricultural production, while envisioning a socially integrated and balanced urban system. The conceptual framework for this project stems from Professor Richard Weller's research and publication, The Atlas for the End of the World. Here he reveals which are the most important hotspots, 36 hotspots worldwide. What are hotspots? These are areas of great biodiversity threatened by urbanization and other entropic forces. Colombia occupies the third position in the world ranking of biodiversity. Rich ecosystems converge in La Sabana, an elevated plateau at 2,600 meters above sea level in the heart of the Andes. These are comprised by tropical rainforests, the hills that serve as a backdrop to the city, the remains of wetlands that once occupied the entire savanna, and endemic habitats in the highlands called paramos. These ecosystems appear as fragmented patches and they are threatened by urbanization and agricultural practices. Bogota is one of the few Latin American cities that obtains close to 60% of its food from its immediate hinterland, its productive savanna. Untreated urban wastewaters pollute the streams and particularly the Rio Bogota. Pollution also derives from fertilizers, from grazing, agricultural practices, and from the production of flowers, one of their main economic activities. Close to 9 million people live in the municipality of Bogota. It's a highly segregated city, socially and spatially. Half of the population live in the formal city. The other half live in self-constructed settlements, although they are highly consolidated. Due to the lack of uh, urbanizable land within Bogota over the past years, 1.8 million people have moved into La Sabana eroding the agricultural land. In gated communities, informal settlements, there are also industrial areas, private universities, big commercial boxes. Over 34 municipalities are in La Sabana, each one of them developing their own urban plan without a territorial vision. The following are the main strategies proposed by our interdisciplinary group to address the problems previously described, and to accommodate 5 million additional inhabitants in the metropolitan system Bogotá, La Sabana, over the next 30 years. The first one is a green territorial network comprised of the existing habitats, linking them with created, with enhanced habitats, where wetlands are increased 10 times, not only for habitat restoration, but also to address flooding. At the center of the scheme, mediating between the existing city and the new city, there is a green heart. This green heart is five times larger than Central Park, New York, and allows to accommodate large recreational facilities, universities, nurseries. The scheme also relies in the ecological restoration of the Rio Bogota and its tributaries. The second strategy aims to improve agricultural production in a way amicable to the ecological systems and connected to urban life. There is an effort to protect the rich agricultural land, the agricultural landscapes, introducing agroforestry and centralizing the production of flowers near the new airport in order to be able to treat the effluents and to reduce transportation costs. 
The third strategy envisions a balanced metropolitan system between Bogota and the municipalities of La Sabana. Currently, the municipalities of La Sabana act as dormitory communities where residents have to commute long distances and many hours to access jobs and services. The metropolitan vision for La Sabana relies on a public transportation system, which allows to increase density over mixed-use corridors, offer employment and amenities within all municipalities, and a system of incentives and zoning codes establishes that a certain percentage of the land in each municipality has to be dedicated for self-constructed communities, thus favoring social mix. We believe that a sustainable vision for a metropolitan system of this nature derives of a composite of the strategies previously described. This approach can certainly be a reference for other large Latin American cities. For each of the four categories, we have selected two very distinct case studies. This time we would like to finalize with one dedicated to Ciudad de Guatemala. If the main challenge in Bogota was to avoid an urban continuum that would erode the agricultural land and the environmental assets, the case of Ciudad Guatemala is very different. Its territory is fragmented by very deep ravines, which increases social segregation, difficult mobility between the different urban patches. The urban areas turn their back to the ravines. The density is low, there is urban sprawl, and the peripheral areas act as dormitory cities. While the territorial aspects are as complex as in Bogota, and the strategies developed by the students and the individual projects are equally rich in results, we would like to focus in some of the class dynamics that made this studio so successful. The students began by getting to know the territory, analyzing the natural systems, the urban systems, and the social cultural landscape. They worked with very large scale maps. Then we went on a 10-day trip to Ciudad de Guatemala where we were received by our peers at the Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala who organized an intense uh, series of lectures and site visits um, and also incorporated uh, representatives of the different municipalities of institutions uh, and of NGOs. The site visits allowed to pre-select some of the sites that we will be working on during the rest of the semester analyzing their assets, their challenges and opportunities, and also allowed to revise the initial research. The students would probably tell you that what they enjoyed the most was engaging with the outstanding natural and cultural landscapes of Guatemala and with their wonderful people. Perhaps a highlight of the visit was a two-day charrette held in the university with local students and municipal representatives. Working first in an overall view of the city, then they broke into three different groups, north, center, and south. The second day, they developed uh, more detailed proposals for the different areas, and by the end of the day, they presented their work to a panel of jurors from the universities, from the communities, and from the municipalities. As a result, the students agreed on three strategic goals that would guide the development of their group and individual projects during the semester. One, establishing green armatures. Two, improving the connectivity and mobility with the creation of sub-centers to attain balanced districts. And three, addressing the social cultural uh, landscape and reducing the inequalities. Once back at Penn, the students defined eight strategic locations, which they felt were those that had the greatest uh, possibilities to induce change in the territorial system and were emblematic of moves that could be emulated throughout uh, the metropolitan area. Establishing an efficient transportation system was a compelling task 
uh, a combination of light rail, BRTs, and gondola systems. Also defining where um, important metropolitan parks uh, could be developed in a city lacking recreation facilities. And this was done taking advantage of the very few large tracts of land in public hands. Um, another goal was to establish centralities, that is, making the districts more autonomous, uh, providing jobs and amenities and services. Thanks to the participation of representatives of different municipalities of Ciudad de Guatemala during the charrette, many of the sites selected by the students are those that have been in the public eye, in public debate for many years. Site number one is comprised of very challenged informal settlements that sprung up in the vicinity of the city's main landfill. Site number two corresponds to the old train station, now defunct. The right-of-way of the train will be used to introduce the first mass transit system of the city. This public land has been um, targeted by developers to introduce high-scale hotels, offices, and residences, while the heritage sector claims for its conservation, recycling due to it, their architectural value and historic value. Another site, infrastructural site, is the existing airport, located only a mile and a half from the historic district, causing pollution, noise, and dissecting the surrounding uh, urban areas. Other students worked in the peri-urban area of Villanueva, located in the south of the city. Villanueva is essentially a dormitory community. The urban scenario is comprised of a patchwork of fragmented areas, informal settlements, low-density gated communities, industrial zones, large commercial boxes, which are gradually eroding rich agricultural soils. There are also remnants of habitats of waterways, although also fragmented. Here, the strategy aimed at creating a robust green armature tying habitats agriculture, and new recreational areas, and creating new centralities, mixed-use districts providing jobs and employment and amenities in order to make Villanueva more autonomous and reduce the need of displacement of transportation to the central area of Ciudad de Guatemala. The Guatemala Studio offered participants the opportunity to work at different scales from a large territorial vision to very precise site-specific interventions. Let's zoom in in one of the sites. The large ter vacant terrain that you see here at the left corresponds to a public agricultural school, currently walled off, segregating residential neighborhoods of different income. Here, the design strategy is aimed at establishing an uh, ecological and um, agricultural corridor, transversal links, connecting the different communities with civic amenities, an area of mixed use, mid-density, a new centrality anchored on the BOT system. Let's further zoom in. Here we can see in more detail the proposal in which the residential areas connect or bleed into the agricultural landscape. Some members of the team worked in more detail in the system of public spaces in these civic transversal armatures. Others focused on the self-constructed community and the new self-constructed communities, establishing the system of public spaces, the location of the community gardens, the distributions of lots over which the community, departing from a simple uh, shelter, could gradually consolidate and expand their dwellings. They also focused on the nature of the community gardens, on the appropriate planting material, and how these gardens could boost the local economy. They defined the location and the architectural quality 
of important community services as markets, and libraries, sport facilities. After the semester was over, additional work was put in to edit, condense, unify graphics, and translate the most relevant information into Spanish to make it accessible to local actors, particularly to the municipal governments that had helped us envision these projects. Seeding change in the Latin American landscape will certainly require new planning and design paradigms, interdisciplinary and multi-scalar training in order to improve the professional response with sincere community engagement and non-corrupt and qualified political leadership. Design and planning intelligence should be able to address the spatial, the morphological conditions, as well as the processes that they can sustain ecological, economic, sociocultural, productive, political. And it's always good to remember that while there are common challenges throughout the region, there are no generic responses. They must be site-specific. Muchas gracias.